Good morning, church. My name is Grace, and this passage this morning is from Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 29. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold, came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid, and I went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever is, has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Thanks, Grace. So I've always had a hard time letting other people borrow my things. I love the idea of sharing. It's great to share, right? We were taught to share. But oftentimes I get worried that the borrower were to return my things damaged or broken. And so they cost me something, so they were valuable to me. And if I'm really honest, it might have been an obsession I had as a kid that something I owned would be valuable one day. So I wanted to keep it in the best condition as I could. Might have spent a little too much time on eBay looking at silly things like hot Cheetos resembling real life things and the possible profit that it could make. And so uh, this is the listing price of a hot Cheeto. That's like a Nike swoosh sign. I don't know if it sold for 40 bucks, but you know, the internet, you can find some Pretty crazy things on there, some weird things and so. Yeah, so it's hard in trusting others with my belongings, but I'm, I'm learning. While it's hard for me to share, I have friends around me who don't hesitate to borrow any of their belongings to others. And so I go ahead and I use their stuff and break their stuff. Just kidding. Now for them, their belongings, they saw it as replaceable. They were supposed to be used. They knew that stuff broke and things could be replaced, so it wasn't an issue. 
There was one situation where I went to go meet up with a friend and he had recently acquired a car. It wasn't a brand new car, it was an older car, but he had just got a new, uh, he had recently acquired a, a car. It worked fine and when I pulled up to his driveway, uh, when I saw it like the second or third time, I was horrified. I pulled up and his windshield had multiple sized, uh, softball sized cracks in it, in the front windshield and the back. It looked like someone took a baseball bat to his car and I gasped in disbelief of what had happened. But he came out and he just kind of laughed it off, cracking a joke that he'd missed driving it because the air conditioning still blew cold even though it was 10, 15 year old. This is the very reason why I'm hesitant to borrow to others. I don't think I would have reacted the same way that he did. I think I would have been upset, frustrated. When I let someone borrow my things, I hope that they would take care of the belongings like I would. I expect that it would come back the way that it did. And so this concept of borrowing and entrusting someone, someone with something, uh, with some, so, trusting, entrusting someone with something that's your, uh, not yours, but someone, uh, belongs to someone else, is part of the passage that Grace just read for us. It's probably a passage that many of us have heard if we've been around church. It's a passage that's commonly preached when Christians talk about money, specifically how we're responsible for money. Another word that we use for this is stewardship. It's how we're responsible with the money and the resource that God has blessed us with. And so we thought it would be a good fit to include it in our series, Jesus Talks Money. And so let me re quickly recap the, the parable that Grace read for us, and let's see what it has to say regarding money. So the parable begins in verse 14 with again. And this is important because we just don't start sentences with again. So 14 is a connection to the rest of chapter 25, and Matthew chapter 25 is a connection to uh, Matthew chapter 24, the chapter before it, and the chapter after. And so to understand this passage here, we have to understand this whole block of scripture, this whole, whole um, block of passage here uh, to understand what Jesus is talking about. And so this, these three chapters here is often referred to as the Olivet Discourse. And it's named that because Jesus taught on the Mount of Olives. And he specifically teaches about the end of times when he returns. And so the parable of the talent then is also sandwiched between three other parables that describe to the believers what they should do in preparation of Jesus' return. And so the parables include this. The parable of the faithful and unfaithful servants, you'll find that in chapter 24 of Matthew. The parable of the ten virgins, that comes right before the parable that we're going to be in today, which is the parable of talents. And then after the parable of talents, we get the parable of the sheep and goats. And to remind us, a parable is basically a story that uses everyday situations to illustrate a profound spiritual truth. And Jesus used these parables very often in his teaching. And so in the parable of talents, we're told that a master is going on a journey and he entrusts three servants with his money and divides eight talents among the three of them based on their abilities. He gives them these talents with the hope that they would do something productive with it while he was gone. Now, a talent is something that we don't, uh, is a term of measurement that we don't use today, but it was, it was back in biblical times, it was a unit of weight for money. And the weight of money ranged anywhere from 60 to 70 pounds. A talent was worth the equivalent of 20 years of work. Now, if we put that into modern day equivalency, average salary is about $60,000 a year. So you take $60,000 and you multiply it by 20 years, that's a little over a million dollars. And so a talent was a lot of money. So the master gives the first servant five talents. The second receives two talents. And the last gets one, and then he leaves for his journey. And immediately after the master leaves for his journey, for his journey, the two servants who received more went ahead and invest and put their, their talents uh, in places where they could produce more money. Whereas the last servant who received one talent dug a hole and hid his money. 
Eventually, the master returns from his journey and asks how they use his money. The two servants who received more doubled what they were given. And the master responds to their success by saying the same thing to both of them. He says this, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. He says this to the servant who has five talents, and he says this to the servant who has, who has two talents. And I think one thing that we can learn from this is that the master isn't concerned of who made more because he gave the same compliment or the same praise to both servants. He isn't concerned about who made more um, or what amount did each person make, but because um, they both received the same praise, even though they received different amounts, the master was more pleased in their faithfulness and the responsibility to do what the master expected. They maximized the opportunity the master gave them, but the servant who received one admitted to just digging a hole and hiding it. And he justifies it by saying this, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. Now I must admit, as, as I was studying this passage here, this parable got me feeling a little easy, uneasy that the third servant experienced the master being a hard man who harvested where he didn't sow and gathered where you haven't scattered seed. So imagine if someone told you to go and harvest someone's crops in the community garden right behind us. It's like, wait, what right do you have to take someone else's garden or someone, someone else's crops? And so the third servant experiences the, the, the master this way. And you know, to be honest, I was thinking through the, 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 the situation. If I was entrusted with 20 years of a salary, I think I'd be a bit hesitant too. What makes matters worse is that in verse 26, it sounds like the master admits to this when the master says... So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gathered where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the banker so that when I return, I would have received it back with interest. And so initially reading it, it's like, oh man, is the master affirming that he is a hard man? As we break it down some more, and if we understand where the master's coming at, the master isn't agreeing with the servant that he's a hard man. Instead, he's asking the servant, well, if that's how you perceive me, if you perceive me to be a hard man, shouldn't that be a motivation to cause you to work harder? I don't know about you, but whenever I have a hard manager at work or, or even in grade school, I had a hard teacher, I didn't want to have to deal with whatever consequence or whatever lecture I was going to get. So I was like, you know, I'll work hard. But I know, you know, we all operate a little differently. But again, the master was, was, was poking at the third servant, asking him, if you perceive me with the, as, as, as a hard man, again, shouldn't that cause you to work harder? And then minimally, the master offers, hey, you could have at least earned some interest by putting in the bank. Instead, the servant, in saying that the master is a hard master, that is just simply an excuse. And the master reveals the reality that he's actually the third servant with the one talent, that he is actually wicked, lazy, and worthless. And as a consequence, he gets banished. Now, what we can learn about the parable is this, because parables have one profound spiritual truth that Jesus is pulling pulling from, from everyday, everyday experiences, right? One thing we can learn from the parable is this. The context of the parable is that, again, it's sandwiched between Jesus' teaching about the end of times. So the master in the parable is Jesus. The journey represents him going to heaven after he died on the cross. The servants are Jesus' disciples who are blessed with the abilities and resources to do Jesus' work while they wait for his return. And so the profound truth that we find from the parable is this. Use your God-given abilities and resources to their fullest potential. Use your God-given abilities and resources to their fullest potential. Now, before we move any further, I want to remind us that the things we do from God come first from our faith in God. 
And so I hope that we don't go away hearing today that we have to go and do more things and, and you know, do more things with the abilities and resources that God has given me, and that makes us good. It's not quite the case. When it comes to our faith in Jesus, the focus is that our faith begins with Jesus. That when we believe in who Jesus is, when we believe in what Jesus says about himself, when we believe what Jesus has done for us, that our belief in Jesus leads us to experience a transformation. And in that transformation, our thoughts, our desires, our passions are changed so that we don't think just for ourselves, but we think and we desire like Jesus does. And when this happens, this leads us to act. And so using your God-given abilities and resources to their fullest potential isn't doing it just to do it. It isn't going through the motions. You see, when we go through the motions and we just do it to get it over, we simply do it because we think it's expected of us. But we don't have any interest. We don't have any enthusiasm. We don't have any sympathy. We don't have any passion to do it. Jesus desires for us to use our God-given abilities and our resources because we are interested, we are enthusiastic, we are sympathetic about what he is interested in, what he is enthusiastic about, what he is sympathetic about. So we must first trust Jesus and then that drives our doing. For some of us who are familiar with church, been in church for a long time, we can relate to this. Oftentimes we're so used to doing, but we too, who have been followers of Christ for many years or for a couple years or newly following Christ, we can be reminded that again, it always begins with believing in Jesus. Consider what it means for you to trust Jesus and not yourself. Because our doing for Jesus comes from our believing in Jesus. And when we have a firm foundation, a grasp of that, next thing we could do is we can be responsible for what God has blessed you with. Be aware of the skills, the abilities, the resources that you have and how you can contribute. Have the self-awareness to know what you're good at. Sometimes, though, when we have an unhealthy version of that, it becomes insecurity. And sometimes insecurity can cause us to hide our abilities. It could cause us to hide our resources. Because insecurity tells us, tells you that, hey, what you have is not good enough. The issue of insecurity is that it leads you to believe, that some, leads you to believe something that isn't real and you begin to believe a lie. Sometimes I wonder if that's what the servant with the one talent struggled with because he received just one talent. Because he received less, maybe he felt less than. But that wasn't true with the servant who received two talents. He didn't have any issue. He received fewer talents than the servant who received five, but he was confident in his ability and he was able to multiply what he had. And so I believe that you have something to offer, regardless of how big or how small. You are blessed by God who gives you good gifts. We may not be able to produce the same amount. We may not be able to produce the same quantity, but that's not the issue. It's a matter of just being faithful. Don't let insecurity rob you from using your God-given abilities and resources to their fullest potential. If it's not insecurity, maybe it's passivity. I think this can be a common issue in our ethnic context. We might be passive because we don't want to show off or we don't want to boast. We just want to blend in. If you act out of your transformation and believing who Jesus is, you know it's not about you, but it's a response to God. And so be willing, instead of being passive, be willing to take initiative and take a risk. God desires us to be active with our abilities and our resources. And if we don't ever do something, we'll never know its impact. 
And so find opportunities to step into something God is inviting you to. Don't expect perfection. Don't compare. Growth and development are a natural part of our spiritual journey. And growth and development show us that we are reaching for our potential. You see in all this, in being faithful to using the God-given abilities and resources that he's blessed us with, God rewards us for our faithfulness. We're invited to be responsible over more and more and more things when we step into being faithful. And most importantly, God is happy when you are faithful and God desires for you to experience that happiness with him.